Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the BPL's Local and Family History Lecture Series. I'm Jesse Wheeler. I'm the Genealogy Specialist here at the BPL. Our speaker tonight is Ian Spangler, who is the Assistant Curator of Digital and Participatory Geography at the Leventhal Map Center. So before we get going, just a couple of uh, basic things we have to go over. First of all, we acknowledge that the Boston Public Library's Central Library stands on land that was once a water-based ecosystem providing sustenance for the indigenous Massachusetts people and as a place which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange among nations. We are committed to land acknowledgements for all locations at which we operate. We reaffirm this commitment to set the context for our planning, deliberations, and public engagement will take place from the spirit of welcome and respect, found in our motto, free to all. This program is being recorded, so if you miss something, don't worry about it. I will send a link to everyone once uh, the recording is available. And there is a handout. I am going to pop that into the chat for everyone. And the chat box is open, as some of you have already discovered. So feel free if you want to talk amongst yourselves. If you have any questions, we will have plenty of time for questions at, at the end of Ian's presentation. So we're Okay, and we will also be sending you uh, in our follow up email, you will have links to the chat transcript or anything else that might be important to come up. Okay, so as I said, our speaker today is Ian Spangler. He is a cultural and economic geographer with interests in digital mapping, historical geographies, and race and landscape in the United States. So I think I said your title already. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Ian. Awesome. Thanks so much, Jesse. And thank you for having me here today to talk about uh, maps and doing genealogical research with you all. Um, just to follow up briefly on your statement, uh, acknowledging some of the histories that uh, that underpin um, these conversations, you know, the maps in our collection uh, that we steward over at the Map Center also bear witness to these histories of colonial expropriation, labor struggles, racial segregation, and, and all sorts of other things. So I think in examining these maps and sort of thinking through the family histories and genealogies and ancestral histories that they help us answer, it's also important to bear in mind what they omit and what they don't depict, um, which are, are full of really uh, rich and important stories to tell that um, these maps only begin to do. Um, so we'll dive into some of those uh, some of those questions today, and we'll mostly be focusing on a couple of specific uh, types of maps uh, that you can find at the Leventhal Center and the BPL's collections, which help uh, tell the stories that uh, you all might be interested in uh, telling about your own uh, family histories. Um, so without further ado, let's jump into things. I, I wanna start off by just telling you a little bit about the Leventhal Map and Education Center, if you're not familiar with us. Um, we operate out of the Boston Public Library's uh, Copley location. Uh, we've been there since about 2004, um, and we've been in this uh, part of the building that you see on the screen here. It's just right at this intersection between um, the McKim building and the Boylston Street buildings. We've been there for about a decade. Um, the Map Center stewards the Boston Public Library's collection of cartographic objects. Um, we estimate that number to be at about a quarter million. Uh, that includes flat maps, rolled maps, uh, charts, globes, atlases, and many more uh, kinds of cartographic material, um, all of which uh, is really yours as the public. Uh, we're here to serve the public's interests, uh, you know, from casual to more intense research purposes. Um, and if you're ever interested in seeing any of these materials, do not hesitate to reach out to us at the MAP Center to get set up for an in-person appointment. Um, we're always really excited to do that kind of work with you all. Um, thankfully, it looks like we have a, a pretty far-flung audience tonight. Um, if you're not based in Boston or Massachusetts and you can't make a trip over here, we also have over 11,000 uh, maps and other materials digitized and available for free online for you to look at as well. Um, so that is always an option and I'll talk about accessing those materials uh, over the course of this, uh, this presentation. As part of our work uh, opening up these cartographic materials to the public, uh, we try to showcase them in our public spaces quite regularly. 
Um, this big picture on the bottom left here is our gallery. Um, and in our gallery, we rotate through various public exhibitions uh, that display not just items from the MAP Center's collections and BPL's collections, but oftentimes maps from many other institutions and libraries uh, across the US. Uh, this picture on the top right is uh, a picture of our learning center. We often just call it the classroom. It's a space where you're welcome to come in and just do work, uh, read books about geography and cartography, um, or thumb through some of our atlases or puzzles that we keep on that big shelf in the back there. And lastly, I want to shout out our K-12 education team, which does some really amazing work and outreach uh, with public schools, especially across the greater Boston area. Um, to expose children to these maps and give them a chance to enjoy and learn from them. Currently on display in our gallery, we have two shows. Um, I It might feel like a lot, but I think that we've done a good job of sort of fitting a lot of different materials in there. Um, and the one on the left you see here, Getting Around Town, uh, Four Centuries of Mapping Boston in Transit is our sort of topical exhibition. We regularly rotate through different uh, sort of themes uh, that uh, tell stories uh, through the maps in our collections. And this one is on uh, the public transit history in Boston. Um, it was guest curated by Stephen Boucher, who uh, whose book Boston in Transit is being uh, re-released in the second edition with MIT Press uh, this year. So do keep an eye out for that um, and feel free to reach out if you'd like to visit the collections. They're open to the public six days a week at no cost. Um, on the right, Becoming Boston, Eight Moments in the Geography of a Changing City is our more permanent collection. Um, it focuses on eight different moments uh, in the history and geography of the city of Boston that sort of tell its story of urban growth and change over the years, uh, beginning with how maps and, and specifically um, maps from the 17th and 18th centuries were used uh, as tools during the expropriation of indigenous land uh, in what we now know as Boston and the Boston region. Um, so that goes all the way through from the early times uh, up to today um, and, and imagines the sort of futures that we, we might keep in mind of the city. So having said all of that, uh, why should you care about maps for genealogical research? Um, many of you who have done this work might already know how useful maps are in genealogical research and family history. Um, it's important to know where people lived, right? Um, and sort of trace how they've moved through and across time. Um, really anyone who is interested in understanding the movement of a family or your ancestors, uh, probably encounters addresses at some point uh, in that process. Uh, and it's very hard to map those historical addresses to modern geographies. So working through these historic maps can not only provide really useful insight into where people actually lived, um, but in some ways, uh, more importantly, it also gives you a sense of what the built environment uh, was like at the time, right? What kind of world did these people live in? These maps can help tell those stories too. Um, so I think they play a really important role in answering both kind of concrete empirical questions about where people were, as well as some of the more sort of interesting uh, questions about what life was like uh, when they were alive. So we'll look at a few different kinds of maps that help us answer those questions. Um, as well as other resources for going beyond maps uh, to supplement these questions. So first off, I wanna highlight uh, our digital collections at the Map Center. Um, you can find especially uh, trigonometric surveys to be really useful from those collections. Um, we'll take a look at Digital Commonwealth, which has a, an incredible host of photographs and postcards and newspapers and other historic materials, um, over a million that have been consolidated from across uh, Massachusetts. We'll spend some time with the Leventhal Center's tool, Atlascope. Um, many of you may be familiar with this. It is our tool for examining uh, and exploring the library's collection um, of over a hundred geo-referenced urban atlases. And in many ways, the urban atlases are sort of the, uh, the ideal genealogical research tool. So Atlascope is quite useful for that work. I'll take a 
little bit of time to look at familysearch.org, uh, which is a, you have to sign up for an account with this website, but it's probably the easiest way to access historic census records, uh, which include not just the census, but birth, death, and uh, military conscription uh, records. I'll show a little bit of our non-digital collections, um, primarily our survey collections, which focus especially on Boston and the Back Bay filling, but also cover uh, some areas in New Hampshire and other places in, in Massachusetts. Um, <clears throat> and, and I'll close, well, really I'll open uh, with the Bureau of Land Management's land plats and survey records. Um, this is mostly gonna be focused on Massachusetts, so I'm not gonna spend much time on that, but it's important to know it exists. So let's jump into it. Uh, right. So doing research with the general land office records, um, again, I, like I said, this is where we'll start, but it really won't have a ton of bearing on the work that folks based in Massachusetts are doing. Um, this website, uh, hosted by the Bureau of Land Management um, from the U.S., uh, the, you know, the state, um, this uh captures and catalogs all of the information and patents and, and sort of plats and field notes associated with the public land survey system uh, beginning in 1788. Uh, and it, they extend all the way up to today. So this can be really useful information to parse through and thumb through uh, if you're looking to study uh, information about who inherited or was given, you know, sort of public land grants, um, especially at the turn of the, the 19th century. Um, again, this, this does not really have anything to do with Massachusetts genealogical research, but, uh, obviously as families move and migrate, um, you know, you might have, you might find yourself needing to go to, you know, uh, Arkansas or Oklahoma for some of these materials and records. And, and perhaps this would be a useful resource for you to explore. Um, so that is, that is a good place to, a uh, good thing to know about. Um, I'll pivot now to some of our physical survey collections. These are materials that are not yet digitized, um, but if you're based in Boston or if you're not based in Boston and you want to come visit, you can take a look at these in person. Um, we have a few archival collections that are really, really spectacular. Um, they're fine-grained surveying records from two collections primarily, uh, the Perkins Surveying Records and the Robert Bellamy Papers. Uh, the Perkins surveying records cover uh, quite a few different surveys, uh, the Mason surveys, Whitney and Fuller drawings, um, and uh, Whitney and Fuller's drawings of the Back Bay. Um, so these mostly uh, deal with uh, 19th century and early 20th century materials in some cases. Um, that's sort of the timeline we're working with. Uh, and they are maps and surveys that sort of sketch out uh, property boundaries and ownership, right, from this time. Um, obviously, for folks who are interested in genealogical research, uh, land ownership and surnames are a huge, uh, a hugely important uh, part of, of why these maps can be useful. And I'll also note that one of my favorite parts of these collections are the field notes that surveyors used and sort of scratch down their information in. Um, I'm not sure the extent that that's useful for folks doing family history research, uh, but they are some of the most fascinating documents um, and, and sort of untouched in a lot of ways that we have in our collections. You know, just these little field notebooks that people used as they walked around uh, Boston in 1870 um, and, and sort of, you know, surveyed the area. Um, the Bellamy papers uh, similarly comprise uh, items from mid 19th to mid 20th century. Um, a handful of other New England towns. Uh, so these are another great place to go for examining some survey records. Um, again, these uh, are not digitized, but I would love to help connect you with our reference and cataloging librarian, Lauren Chen, who would be more than happy to uh, give you a chance to dive into these in person. Um, I'll, I'll include uh, my email and other ways that you can reach out to me at the end of the talk, um, if that's of interest to you. So let's move on to the digital collections. This is really where we can get into the nitty gritty of doing genealogical research. Um, and I wanna talk specifically about some kinds of maps, right? And just give you the tools that you uh, need to explore some of, these, uh, some of these questions about family history. Um, the digital collections contain, like I said, over 11,000 maps. Um, 
But one type of map that I think is really useful and interesting for sort of setting the scene are our bird's eye view maps. Um, we have lots of aerial views of cities from the late 19th century, especially. Um, and those maps did a pretty spectacular thing for the time, right? They imagined what the city looked like from above when people didn't really have the technology, uh, especially not everyday people, to envision that, right? They don't really know what the city looks like uh, as, a, a, as a bird, right? Looking at it uh, from, from uh, the sky down. So artists and cartographers would often imagine these views. Um, certainly they would do some kind of uh, sort of perspectival uh, work to estimate, you know, the distances and try to make it as realistic as possible. But these are really, uh, these are more artistic than they are scientific. Uh, these maps, uh, not only do they show what the built environment of a city was like at the time, but they also highlight important features associated with a place. So we have lower mills here, for instance. And if you zoom into the, um, all of this material sort of encircling uh, on the border of the map itself, um, you can see that there are specific institutions and businesses that are often listed. Um, and these would have been sponsoring organizations that that sort of paid, this is sort of advertising, right, at the nineteenth late 19th century. Uh, you pay some amount of money to be included um, quite prominently on the map. And if we zoomed into the map itself, we would probably find, for example, the Walter Baker and Company's chocolate mills uh, labeled somewhere on the map itself. So while this does not necessarily include information that would be uh, illuminating for a really fine grained, you know, if you wanted to search for the Spangler family and how they moved through the city, this is not the map for you. But what it can do is paint a picture of what the city might have felt like at this time. Um, you know, and, and again, this is all sort of artistic rendering, but, um, but some of the most rich uh, documents that we have for uh, making those guesses. Another set of maps that are that are really useful for this kind of research and get a little closer to answering questions about actual surnames and how people moved are our land ownership and survey maps from the mid 19th century. You see the screenshot on the right here is um, is a shot of the map of Middlesex County um, from Henry F. Walling. And that's a really important name to remember, Henry F. Walling. Uh, the Henry F. Walling maps, Henry F. Walling was the, uh, a surveyor, an engineer who um, surveyed a ton of counties uh, in Massachusetts. I know that that's not really an aerial unit that we think of in Massachusetts today, but um, that is how these were surveyed. So it's sort of at the county level. Um, and many of these were published between the 1850s and the 1890s. Um, if you go into our digital collections and you search Henry F. Walling, uh, all of these county maps will pop up for you and you can sort of thumb through and, and you can see on the bottom right hand here, uh, the sort of breadth and expansiveness of these maps. Um, they, they are mostly uh, drawn at a scale of about one to 47,000. Uh, so they're not super fine grained, but they do get pretty detailed. Um, you can see in each particular town, we've zoomed into Sudbury here. Uh, you can see that they include things like topographical features, uh, where the roads were, and in some cases, road names, um, place names, which can be really, really helpful um, in sort of uh, identifying how things have changed. And probably most importantly, uh, surnames, right, of people appear on these maps. Uh, so this is stuff that was cataloged at the time. Um, it's important to sort of think through, you know, why they were captured, right? Oftentimes, this might have been because they were prominent uh, landowners, for instance. So there are all sorts of questions that we can use to, um, to ask why this map was made in the first place, who the audience was, what it was made for, and why the information you might want is not listed on this map. Um, but at any rate, they are really rich documents for uh, for the 19th century, mid 19th century specifically. Um, we can zoom into Dover here as a sort of complementary example, um, and just see some of the some of the features, some of the hills, um, and the the uh, uh, the landscape uh, that that was surveyed at this time from the Walling Company. We'll talk a bit more about Dover uh, in a couple minutes as well. I want to zoom in closely to uh, Rentham Center here. This is um, 
This is another map uh, from Walling, uh, 1851, map of the town of Rentham. So some of them were, were very fine-grained, even more fine-grained than these maps that we see, for example, of Norfolk County or Middlesex County. Um, in this one, you can see not just the names, not just the streets, but the street names and the buildings themselves, right, uh, peppered along South Street here, um, which maybe turns into Dedham, uh, Dedham Street uh, right around the common. So th these maps uh, include some really rich information about the people who lived in these in these places um, at the mid 19th century. Uh, if you're cross referencing this with other family records, other genealogical information, um, it can be a very useful way to actually place people uh, in time and space. Um, of course, we don't have uh, the finest grain from these maps. You know, even at this at this very zoomed in level. Uh, we don't see addresses, and in many cases, addresses might be the thing that you that you really need um, to to make some final determinations. So, you know, these maps are useful, but they don't get us all of the way there. Uh, <clears throat> before we talk about the the sort of uh, the urban atlases, which I, I think are the the most useful for doing this research. I just want to pivot a little bit towards Digital Commonwealth, um, which is one of the other research resources that uh, I recommend you explore if you haven't already. Um, Digital Commonwealth is a consortium uh, across uh, all of Massachusetts that uh, is basically a, a digital library um, that takes many, many members, many libraries, museums, and other cultural heritage institutions, um, takes their digitized collections and sorts them uh, into this massive library with over a million things uh, ranging from photographs to postcards to newspapers, um, all sorts of, of amazing resources that uh, often include actual people, but um, if nothing else, give you a great sense, just like that bird's eye view map of what a place uh, was like at, at a certain point in time. So for example, we can jump back to this map of Lower Mills here. And if you recall, there was this uh, Walter Baker and company's chocolate mills down here in the bottom. Um, if a simple search in Digital Commonwealth will turn up many, many uh, hits for Walter Baker and company's uh, materials, their postcards, their advertising. Uh, you can see in this one, this uh, manufacturers of chocolate and cocoa preparations uh, postcard that I've selected just by way of example, uh, does have some writing on the verso or on the back of the, the postcard. Uh, so there are all sorts of, of really interesting avenues into doing this kind of historical research. <clears throat> and in many ways, platforms like Digital Commonwealth are as much starting points as they are sort of answers to your questions about genealogical research. Um, you might discover something totally new that you didn't know about uh, from, from looking at a map and sort of seeing what kinds of institutions were around and, and pivoting towards digital commonwealth to look at the photos and the postcards. Um, and, and that can help uh, paint the picture uh, in many ways. So here we've, I've finally arrived us at the sort of uh, mother load of, of really great uh, historical and genealogical research tools. And that's the Urban Atlas Collection. Um, the Boston Public Library has a really significant collection of urban atlases, which are really big, thick books. Uh, you can see a selection of them from our um, our collections uh, right here that detail ex very fine-grained uh, surveys of cities um, and towns in Massachusetts. These urban atlases were made uh, by a number of different companies, a number of different engineering and surveying firms largely between 1860 and 1940. So that's the sort of time period that we're operating in with these atlases. And they're very much a product of their time. They're not really made anymore today in the same way. Um, over the course of the 20th century, they become much more expensive to make. Uh, map making changes, you start doing it with computers more than these, these lith lithographed maps and sort of hand surveyed things. So the, the process changes, but there's also another important thing that stops these maps from circulating as widely. Um, we got better at making buildings uh, and we got better at making buildings more fire resistant. A great deal of these urban atlases were actually made uh, for fire insurance. Uh, the Sanborn Company is probably the most well-known fire insurance uh, mapping company and they produced uh, thousands and thousands of these atlases, famously for smaller towns across the US. 
Um, so if you head over to the Library of Congress's website, they've digitized tens of thousands of Sanborn fire insurance maps. Um, and you can really get lost in a lot of uh, interesting rabbit holes by looking at these things. Um, at the Map Center and, and BPL, uh, we mostly have Bromley atlases, which were not, uh, they, they were uh, made around the same time by George uh, Bromley's engineering and surveying company. And uh, those atlases were not for fire insurance. They were really for tax assessment. So where Sanborns capture uh, very detailed information about the material of buildings, uh, the distances in the streets, um, all sorts of stuff like that. You know, Bromley has that too. But what Bromley is, is great for is that they capture uh, the property information and the owners, right? Because these maps were cadastral, because they were being used for tax assessment purposes, you had to know who owns the building. Um, so here's an example of accessing these maps online. Uh, this is one of our atlases of Roxbury, um, the volume four. Uh, and if we dig into it and crack it open, there are a lot of really important things to point out here. Um, this is just looking at it on our digital collections uh, from the Map Center. So again, uh, you can head over there uh, at collections.leventhalmap.org. Um, there will be links for this in the handout at the end. And you can search for atlases of, of anywhere. Um, so it's very easy to access this stuff. The first thing I want to point out is the street index. Uh, most of these atlases in the first couple pages will have an index of all the streets that appear and where they appear in the atlas. And that is very important because as anyone uh, who has done this sort of historic genealogical research can attest, uh, street names change over time. And not just street names, but addresses actually change. Um, you know, if you're looking for 116 Washington Street uh, today, you know, it might still exist, but it might not be where 116 Washington Street was 100 years ago. So it's very important to reference these street indexes. They can come in super handy for uh, doing family history research. Uh, if you're trying to figure out where someone lived or where a particular address was, uh, these kinds of atlases are really the way to go. Um, after that, you uh, move off the street index and just go, you know, page to page. You've got your uh, index page for the maps themselves right here. It's sort of our table of contents uh, for, for the geographic information. Um, and then each one of these uh, is a super detailed map that captures street names, uh, building dimensions, building material, and property ownership in, in most cases. They were produced often at a scale of about 1 to 50, so they're super fine grained. Um, and you can see a whole lot of information in these maps. Uh, this is a, a deeper zoom on on one of them, um, and just you know note that we've got a cemetery. Uh, the cemetery is owned by the city of Boston. Uh, all of the buildings with stables in them, those uh, or <laughs> with X's in them, those are stables, um, and you'll see those all over the place in the city of Boston. That sort of puts in perspective just how much. Uh, real estate was required to sort of service horses, right, at, at this time in the, in the 19th century. Um, yellow uh, refers to wood, wooden structures, and brick uh, is depicted by pink. So that's just a little introduction to what these maps are telling us. Um, and again, there's tons of information on them that I, you know, don't have time to get into tonight. But if you want to learn more about these maps, uh, again, reach, feel free to reach out anytime. Now, I will say as easy as it is to, to access these online from our digital collections, it's not super ideal, right? You sort of have to page through them one by one. Um, you might not be able to find easily where you're trying to go. Uh, the ideal way to examine these would be to look at them in the same way that we look at Google Maps, right? You're just looking at a top-down view of the city and sort of panning uh, to your heart's desire. So. A couple of years ago, we put together uh, at the Map Center a tool called Atlascope. Atlascope allows us to go from those scanned images to real geographies uh, in the world um, through a process known as georeferencing. And this is just a little view of what Atlascope looks like. We'll dive into this in much greater detail in a couple minutes. Uh, georeferencing is the process of taking these scanned maps um, and assigning spatial data to them. And the spatial data that we assign is just latitudes and longitudes, they're coordinates, right? Um, but in, in assigning that spatial data to the scanned maps, uh, we can make them appear where they're supposed to be in the real world. 
Uh, the idea behind this is basically opening up something called a geographic information system, uh, GIS for short, and saying, oh, that street corner right there, that corresponds to uh, you know, this latitude and longitude in the real world. And if you do that enough times, if you add enough of those uh, what are called control points or anchor points, you can basically get these maps to overlay in modern geographies quite well. So we did that with over 100 urban atlases, um, over 100 and growing. Right now, I think we're at 112 um, of not just greater Boston, but of uh, increasingly of other towns and cities in Massachusetts uh, that you can examine online. Um, the BPL and the Map Center's collections of urban atlases, uh, I've already talked a little bit about this, so I won't, I won't belabor it too much, um, but they range uh, from as early as 1861. Uh, I actually think we have maps that go all the way up to the 1960s. Um, there are some sort of caveats to that. Many of them aren't an atlas scope because of uh, um, copyright issues. So if you want to see the more recent ones, then you still do have to come in person. But for 112, you can view them online on your own at atlascope.org. <clears throat> um, I think that's yeah. Let's uh, let's let's wrap this up. Uh, this sort of presentation part, and then we'll take a little look at Atlascope itself. Um, I just want to draw your attention to a couple more things in the tool before uh, before our live demo. Um, in the new and improved version of Atlascope, we released a, a brand new Atlascope version two this January. Um, so at the beginning of this year, uh, we added some functions for searching our digital collections and searching uh, digital Commonwealth based on the view that you're looking at in Atlascope. So these two buttons here that you see at the bottom of the screen, if you click them, they open up to views of maps and photographs and things in digital Commonwealth that appear within the bounding box that you're looking at uh, in Atlascope. Um, <clears throat> it is still kind of a work in progress. Right now, you'll notice that a lot of the maps that appear are not just of Back Bay, right? They actually include uh, geographies that extend far beyond Back Bay. Um, so that's something that we're still sort of working out. But um, it is a useful tool for jumpstarting some of that supplemental or secondary research uh, to see, to sort of connect across different collections and see what's going on in a place. Um, oh, and I want to conclude by talking about familysearch.org. Um, so like I said, this is not actually associated with a, a library per se, not a public library institution, um, but it is it is really the easiest way to, to access historic census records for free. Um, all you have to do is sign up for an account. You'll see that this is a screenshot from, from the interface in my account, um, my username up there. Um, I've searched for someone named E.F. Hodgson uh, in their uh, registries. I wanted to search for historic census records of this person. So I just typed in you know, E.F. Uh, in the first name and Hodgson in the last name. And I bound my search. I think I looked for pre-1940 because I knew that they would be alive at that time. Um, I'm not sure if anyone in the chat knows who E.F. Hodgson is. Uh, if you do, feel free to sort of sh shout it out. Um, I didn't learn who E.F. Hodgson was until uh, quite recently when we were bringing atlases of uh, maps of Dover uh, into Atlascope. Um, E.F. Hodgson was a Dover-based uh, business owner and, and the Hodgson company sold prefabricated housing right at the turn of the 20th century. Um, in many ways, it was the sort of prefabrication capital of, of the, the Commonwealth um, in, the, in the early 20th century. And in many ways, the nation, uh, they were sort of on the cutting edge of this technology at the time, and all of their offices were based out of Dover. So you can see here that Hodgson brings up quite a few hits in the census records, but I went ahead and guessed. I said, 1917 is the first hit. Let's see uh, if this tells us what we want to, to learn. And indeed, when you click into the scanned image, uh, we can see that Hodgson EF uh, was uh, associated with a business about portable houses right there. Um, we even get an address. Uh, I think that this address is supposed to be 116 Washington. And I uh, I looked on Atlascope. We have an Atlascope layer for 1917. This is 117 
uh, or 116 Washington, where I where I thought it would be. This is Washington Street. Um, I would think 116 is right here, but I didn't see Hodgson's name on the map. So I wondered if maybe there's a different Washington Street. Um, you know, I'm not totally sure. Maybe he was renting and somehow still got uh, flagged in the census, um, but his name wouldn't appear right here. Um, you know, I, there are all sorts of answers. Boston's one of those cities where there, you know, Washington Street could potentially refer to a lot of different places. So who knows? But uh, in many cases, those kinds of connections, right, identifying a record and an address in the census and then pivoting over to the historic maps uh, to see where they actually appear in the real world, that's a pretty common workflow for doing this sort of genealogical research. I will bring it back to Dover, where I knew E.F. Hodgson was based to conclude this and just show you uh, his factories and the company's factories. You can see the name appear two times on this map. Um, is right up here is what I assume to be the residential uh, parcel of lands that Hodgson owned uh, and lived. And down here, closer to the common uh, in in Dover, you've got the actual factory right on the um, right on the railroad line. Presumably, that makes it for really efficient business, um, and that's where they were doing a lot of the prefabricated housing construction, and then shipping off, you know, all over the world. There's actually lots of really interesting stuff in Digital Commonwealth that you can uh, look into about the Hodgson factories. Um, on that note, I I want to wrap up by showing you how you can share your family history by annotating Atlascope. Uh, one of the really neat features that we've added um, in the last year is the ability to uh, mark up Atlascope on your own as a user. Um, and I want to show you how to do that by marking up uh, the Hodgson residence. Um, so we'll do that together. And if you want, I'm going to go ahead and pivot over to a new screen share and bring up Atlascope, and I'll show you how uh, how to do this and how it works. Uh, right. So we are now looking at uh, Atlascope at the Atlascope app. This is the screen that shows up uh, when you open it and navigate to atlascope.org. Um, feel free to pull it up in your own browsers and follow along. Um, there are lots of things that we can do to start, right? If you've got your location enabled on your laptop or your phone, you can bring Atlascope to where you are. Um, you can search places. There is a complete geocoder uh, built into this, so it is aware of addresses, um, but only modern addresses, right? Again, that's sort of the thing where it's not searching historical addresses, and that trips people up a lot. Um, we can take Atlascope tours, which is another new feature that I think is really exciting. We had some wonderful um, interns, high school interns over the summer who wrote some great Atlascope tours about things like uh, tracing the history of the rubber industry, uh, not just in Boston, but across Massachusetts um, in the early 20th century and sort of connecting it up to international circuits of trade and uh, colonialism and rubber in the Congo. Um, and all sorts of uh, all sorts of fascinating conclusions. You know, you can see here the Boston Rubber Shoe Company in in fine detail uh, in in this Atlascope tour. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, but let's go ahead and just start at BPL. Um, if you click start at BPL, you get this view of downtown Boston uh, and all these historic maps that you can toggle through. If you go down here to the Atlases tab and open up. The layers. So right now we're looking at 1874. You can actually see uh, that the Boston Library, Boston Public Library does not uh, exist yet. Uh, there's Boylston Street. Uh, we've got Dartmouth right there. So this is the parcel on which it will eventually be built, but it's it's not been built yet. We can jump forward a couple of years, 1882. Uh, we're starting to see some development in downtown Boston. The Institute of Fine Arts is here. Um, the Boston Albany Railroad and what is the, yeah, the Providence Line. They um, this whole area right here is an enormous rail yard uh, where Huntington Street now now cuts through, um, and so that continues to grow over the years and expand. Uh, but still no BPL. Um, jumping ahead to 1885, uh, Harvard Medical School has set up shop where the Boylston Street building now is, but still no BPL. We've actually got a couple of wooden buildings right over here. And this is interesting. It's actually a, um, a sort of neat uh, 
neat feature of these these maps. I think that we've got a sand sand yeah, it's a Sanborn map. Sanborn atlases were really famous for these pastons. If you zoom in closely here, you can see that this is actually this is not original to the paper, right? It was it was pasted on later, stickied over. Um, instead of uh, going back through and resurveying everything in a city uh, after it had been surveyed um, and making a whole new atlas, the Sanborn company said, no, no, that doesn't make any sense. It's too much work. It's too expensive. Um, let's just figure out what changed and then add it on with a new like set of paper and glue. Um, it was actually, uh, there's been some fascinating in, uh, research in the last few years about uh, how that labor was sort of gendered in the Sanborn offices. It was often the work, uh, women's work uh, and women were doing a lot of the Sanborn paste on additions um, sort of on the assembly line uh, as it were. Um, one of the other neat parts of that is that every time a paste on was added uh, that reset the copyright uh, timeline. So, you know, a map might have been made in 1880, but if it was added to in 1940, then 1940 is the new baseline for when it goes out of copyright, um, which makes it kind of hard for us to bring it into Alloscope. But at any rate, um, if you jump ahead to 1895, we should see, yep, the Boston Public Library now appears, Harvard Medical College is expanding, um, and we've got a lot of the sort of brick buildings that uh, we're familiar with in, in the Back Bay area uh, today. Um, uh, and the Hotel Vendome, yeah, so all sorts of interesting things. Um, one of the features that I love, uh, I mentioned, are annotations, right? So Atlascope supports annotations, user-driven annotations. You can add these in yourselves um, for free and examine what other people have added. Um, you simply do that by clicking into the research tab right here and going to load annotations. Um, <clears throat> click on one and it'll bring you to a particular uh, location that's been annotated. This 1883 atlas is the first one to show the land <clears throat> given to the city for the future BPL site. Um, we didn't actually look at this atlas just now. So it's kind of neat to see that the land has been allocated but no building has been constructed on the parcel yet. Um, this was the original house of worship for spiritualism, the religious movement based on communing with the dead. Really interesting. I didn't didn't know that. That's the first time I'm seeing this annotation. Um, <clears throat> so if you want to add an annotation, how would you go about doing it? Um, well, you just click into research and you go to annotate map. Uh, and I'm going to, unless someone has beat me to it, um, I'm going to jump over to Dover, Massachusetts. We'll click right there. And here we are in Dover. Uh, we're at a familiar location that we saw in my little PowerPoint presentation. And we see the EF Hodgson factory right here. So I'm gonna go ahead and click annotate map. And we have got, actually I'll stop annotating and just see if I'm curious if anyone, okay. So nobody has stolen my thunder and done this annotation um, just yet. So if we draw a little box right here over the EF Hodgson factory, we can close that and add an annotation. So it's as easy as this. Um, let's go ahead and type uh, E. F. Hodgson uh, factory was a preeminent uh, maker of prefabricated housing at the turn of the 20th century. Um, Hodgson's um, Hodgson's dwelling can be seen uh, just north of the factory. Save annotation and stop annotating. Now, in theory, if we load them, we should see it right away uh, and can read through uh, the annotation. So this is one way uh, that you can sort of take part in playing with Atlascope and actually telling your the story of your family's history if it appears um, on these maps, uh, or if it doesn't, right? Maybe these maps leave out parts of your family history. Maybe you have relatives who, you know, grew up in Dorchester, or Roxbury, or Charlestown, or something, and moved from one address to another, but never owned the properties, and so they aren't marked on the maps. Uh, this is one way of uh, making their histories visible and present, um, and it's a way for you to engage with these collections in new ways. Um, so I will stop there. I think that's probably 
enough time uh, of, of me rambling. Um, but what I what I really like to do at the end of these uh, these presentations is turn it over to you for not just questions. I, I am happy to answer questions about the talk. Uh, but if anybody wants to sort of like look at an address and atlascope as a group, feel free to drop that in the chat and I can pull it up and we'll see, you know, what was at, on atlascope in 1922 at, at a certain address. So feel free to drop that in there as well. I see there are a lot of notes in the chat. I haven't been following it, so I'll yeah, turn that's it. That's okay. That's okay. So let's see. So like Ian said, feel free to if you want to look at something in atlascope or if you have a question, pop it in the chat. See. Okay, so referencing something earlier on, Michelle is asking, would those survey records also include notes about businesses located in the surveyed area? Yeah, that's a great question, uh, Michelle. Thanks for that. Um, in some cases, probably. Um, I, I haven't actually looked deeply at these materials yet myself. Um, our cataloging librarian is still in the process of at actually cataloging them. So they're very much in flux. Um, we also have some wonderful volunteers who've been doing a lot of the, the cataloging work. Um, so we're close, we're really close and the archives are I think searchable now and we have the finding aids available. Um, so I, I would love to, I would love to talk to you more if you're curious to sort of look at them yourself and if there are places that you have in mind, uh, don't hesitate to reach out. I know lots of them cover the area of the back bay, like right after it was uh, filled, right after the new land was made. So in those cases, for example, like there weren't any businesses around because it was all totally fresh, right? Excellent, yeah. Okay, so Arlene is asking, are there bird's eye maps only for Massachusetts? Thanks, Arlene. That's a, that's another great question. Um, no, thankfully there are bird's eye maps for everywhere in the U.S. Um, obviously, the Leventhal Center at BPL, you know, we have really strong collections in Massachusetts. But if you head over to the Library of Congress's website, you'll find many more uh, bird's eye view and aerial maps of other towns and cities in different states. Um, another notable map collection that folks might be interested in is the Rumsey map collection that's out of Stanford. Um, so they have over 100,000 uh, digitized maps from, from a really significant collection. Um, and you'll find many bird's eye view maps there as well. I'm going to pop a link to the chat in there. They're, they're a wonderful resource. I have used them before. Okay, let's see. See, where did we leave off here? Okay, so Penelope's asking general question, are 19th century map collections still helpful for non-landowners? Penelope, that is such a such a good question um, that I only I only just um sort of touched on in, in the talk. Um I, I mean the short answer is no. It's 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 really hard to find um to find maps that sort of explicitly display information about tenants um, at, at a certain address. The longer answer is yes, you can make it work, um, but you need to use a lot of different resources, right? So you might use some urban atlases and combine them with city directory information about who actually lived in a property uh, at a given year. Um, let me pull up some maps. Um, Andy Woodruff was our designer in residence over at the Map Center uh, earlier this year, and he did some uh, just amazing research into um, using the urban atlases and combining them with uh, with city directories to visualize how how blocks had changed uh, over the years. I just dropped that into the chat, and you might be interested in looking at that as an example of how uh, you can sort of depict. Um, a place through uh, not just property owners, but through tenants uh, as well. Excellent, okay, so let's see. Uh, let's see, Michelle is asking, do you have insurance slash Bromley maps at the library beyond those that are digitized online? Yes, um, thanks for that. So we do have some, uh, the majority of them are digitized. Um, you might find some, some other like institutions in Massachusetts, for example, that have some that haven't been digitized. Um, the the collections that uh, we make available online are um, 
our, our representative both of BPL uh, and of the State Library of Massachusetts. So it's it's pretty significant. It's hundreds of atlases. Um, and the only ones that aren't digitized uh, kind of as a general rule are the ones that are still under copyright. Um, the Sanborn Company is pretty aggressive at pursuing uh, their copyright. So we we sort of check every January, you know, if like what new atlases might be out of copyright that we can use and, and digitize. Um, and we get those digitized and, and up. But, uh, you know, for the other ones, uh, it, you'd kind of just have to see them in person. Yeah. So, so Melanie has more of a comment. She says, I would love to see Atlas Gov expanded to other cities. That's what brought me to this webinar because I'm looking for a tool like this for other urban areas, Chicago, for example. Yeah, um, I mean, that is, I think it was Melanie, right? Um, that that was something, uh, that's something that we have been thinking really actively about at the MAP Center is how to sort of expand Atlas Scope and partner with other institutions to roll this tool out. Um, the main reason that we haven't done it is it's it's just a ton of um, it's a ton of labor, right? So it's a ton of labor to get the maps geo referenced. Um, here here in Boston, you know, we we work with we've worked with dozens um, of interns and and full time staff uh, and put in thousands of labor hours to not just do the geo referencing work, but sort of build up the code base and do regular run of the mill technical troubleshooting. And, and at the end of the day, you know, we're not really like an IT department. Um, and it's so it's really hard for us to uh, to ship this software out and sort of ensure that it will, um, you know, that it'll work for another institution. In theory, it is open source. Anyone can try to, to you know, spin up their own Atlas Scope Chicago. Um, and we've worked really hard to make it uh, sort of componentized so that it's easy for other people places to do that if they have the technical capacity. Uh, yeah, the short answer to your question is we're working on it. And we've actually talked to folks in Chicago specifically um, who who want Atlas Scope for their their city. So it's it's on the docket, but unfortunately, maybe not for the next couple of years. Before I wrap up that question, I, I do want to send you, um, I'll drop so a link. So Ian, in the uh, just you are, you need to send uh, set it so you're sending things to everyone. You're oh, just sending everyone. it to me. Thank yeah. You. So Thank I'm going to resend that link that you just sent a little while ago. Someone mentioned that they didn't get it. So yes, that should thank be coming. you for that. So that that link that um, that Jesse just sent is the one uh, that that depicts how you can combine uh, city directories with urban atlases and sort of visualize those changes. And I'm about to drop in a link to oldinsurancemaps.net. Um, this is kind go. of similar to Atlascope. Uh, in that it's a crowdsourcing tool. That, so anyone on this call can go georeference some maps on this website right now. Um, it mostly uses maps from the Library of Congress, mostly Sanborn atlases. Um, and you can see that it's pretty extensively representative um, in a lot of different cities. I'm not sure if Chicago's in there just yet. Um, yeah, it looks like there's no Chicago. <laughs> you can tell that it was uh, started in Louisiana um, because there are tons of cities and towns in Louisiana represented there, but I would check that out. Um, give it a try. Okay. Let's see. So Penelope is asking, is there a way to tag the annotations so that they are searchable? Yeah, that's I um not yet. <laughs> but it's another thing that we are we sort of have on our feature list uh, that we really want to do. Um, the annotations are pretty new. You know, we rolled them out this year. And so we're actively looking for feedback about all of this stuff. And uh, would love to to incorporate that in a future version. So thanks thanks for that the, the okay. comment. So I just um, had someone that just just came up. Yeah, I will be sending everyone a copy of the chat transcript. So if you missed a link, everyone will get it. So don't worry about that. Okay. So we have a few addresses that people want to check out here. So the first one comes from Elizabeth. Uh, she would like to see the Boston College of Physicians and Surgeons on Shawmut Avenue in the 1890s. Awesome. Awesome. Um, let me go ahead and get that pulled up. Uh, and before I, while I'm doing that, let me just note, I think I saw in the chat, someone mentioned they didn't want to sign up for, for Notion to see the handout. Um, I'm sorry for, I, I forgot that I think Notion now makes you sign up uh, to see these. So I will send Jesse uh, a, a like PDF or an, a different link. I, uh, to I already did that. No worries. Yes. Amazing. Amazing. You're, you're the best. Um, cool. So, yeah. so everyone, I will 
send you all that link as well in case you missed that. Well, um, all right. Can you give me that address one more time? It was on Shawmut? Uh, it's just at uh, the Boston College of Physicians and Surgeons on Shawmut Avenue in the 1890s. There was no number. Okay. I'm not sure. Boston College of... Uh, of is... Physicians and Surgeons. Boston Eye Physicians and Surgeons. Let me see. That might be a tricky one for our geocoder to find. And I don't know offhand uh, where it is. Let me, sometimes it can be helpful to like check Google Maps, Boston College of Physicians and Surgeons. And it's on Shawmut Okay, uh, so that's, let me see. It's not immediately uh, spinning up for me here. Uh, if, if whoever asked that one, is able to send a modern street address for this location. It would um okay. It would so it would, that uh, might be so that might be something uh so whoever to the person who sent that in and if you don't know where it is exactly you can just send us an email if this is something you're really interested in and we can get back to you. Okay, so let's see. So Meredith wants to take a look at 171 Blue Hill Avenue in Dorchester in 1915. Perfect. Blue Hill Avenue in Dorchester, 171 and 1915. So let's see, uh, we might have to do a little bit of manual hunting here because I didn't see that pop up in our uh, geocoder, but let's skip ahead to 1915. Uh, right. And what was it? 171. So 171 it's probably... Blue Hill. Right. I think it's this direction. Sorry, my face is right in the camera, isn't it? Um. 171. There it is. So 171 Blue Hills right across from Fairbury here. Hopefully that looks like we're in the right place. Um, this looks like uh, a pretty narrow little building. You can see in these buildings where there's some yellow um, with pink on the front, that means that it uh, had like a um, a brick facade or something like that, right? Whereas a, a combination of, of wood and brick in the materials. It looks like this entire parcel is owned by um, Kalman, uh, Kalman M. Uh, Davidson. Kalman M. Davidson. I don't know if that name rings a bell for anybody. Um, I'm also, I'm wondering maybe if this is a property boundary in the middle here. Um, sometimes it can be kind of hard to tell. Um, but we do have these two different numbers, right? 2265 and 3135. Um, I believe that that's uh that describes the area the total area um and then these little twos right here those are stories right so we've got a one story and two story buildings right here um not seeing any triple deckers over here but you can sort of see the triple decker uh geographies uh across julian for example right around the corner we've got our three 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 um, I'm pretty sure that that's what those stand for and it, I could be wrong um and if I am you can fact check me by jumping to the bibliographic information and head, heading over to the actual catalog record um, where you that will link you back to the original source material. And these always include a sort of um, explanation of, of how, uh, how to read the maps. So that's always an option. Um, yeah, this is, this is great. Um, we can sort of see here where, whereabouts are we in, uh, in Dorchester? Yeah. We can pivot through from 1915. Um, see, 1918, actually, that's kind of interesting. This is uh, in 1918 where this is the edge of the atlas. So that address was not surveyed uh, that year. We can jump ahead to 1931, and we'll see 171. Looks like it's been sold or changed, and they've actually added uh, quite a bit of construction to the area. Um, and I think the ownership is different now. Let's let's do a little, I'll just show you one of the other ways that you can use Atlas Scope is by, you can change it to a swipe view, right? So we can, instead of using that little spyglass, we can use this uh, horizontal swiper. And you can also change the overlays on the other side, right? So right now we've got our base layer as the historic map um, or as the modern map, but we can change that so that we are comparing two old maps. And this is kind of a neat way to see how it's changed. So Max Friedman, 1931, uh, yeah, 1931 on the left, 
Um, and on the right, we've got this 1915 layer, the original one uh, from Kalman M. Davidson. Yeah, so a really neat area to look at on Atlascope. And you'll see a lot of these same names repeated over and over again because, uh, you know, property ownership, um, you know, you, you would often see folks uh, sort of carve out parcels in entire neighborhoods um, uh, at this time. So thanks for that, uh, whoever sent that in. Hopefully that's an interesting okay. uh, place to look through. Okay, so we have a couple more addresses, then we can get back to, then we can move over to different questions. So Nancy is asking, is the home of Simeon Giles from the mid 19th century in Atlascope? There is a marker for it in the Arnold Arboretum. Oh, no. okay, we so can. Could... So just looking quickly, uh, like I think Simeon Giles was an African-American farmer who lived in the area. So this is a great case where you, you probably need to do a little bit of, um, we probably need to do a little bit of supplementary research, right? To figure out, to see if we can find Simeon Giles uh, address uh, where, where he lived. Uh, if we could get a number that that would be, that would be perfect. Um, right now, there's no way, you know, the way that Atlascope understands these maps, like the computer doesn't, the computer doesn't know that this, uh, properties owned by Harry Richmond, right? This is just like an image. There's no data associated with it other than it overlays right there. There are some really interesting projects ongoing, um, specifically this, this group called uh, Machines Reading Maps. Um, they're based out of the Turing Center uh, in the UK. Um, and they're using some like machine learning technology to read Sanborn atlases. Um, actually, we could probably do this with the the Rumsey Center because um, they partnered with the Rumsey Center to uh, test out this machine. Yeah, searching for text on maps. So we could search um, using this tool uh, for. Well, let's just search for Boston and see what happens. Um, it's all, it's kind of in a beta testing okay, so, mode. So I have, George is suggesting to try for Simeon Giles 1190 Center Street in Jamaica Plain. Okay, okay let's do it. Um, 11, uh, 1190 Center Street, Jamaica, JP. Awesome, awesome. Okay, so 1870, we have a lot of coverage for this place. 1874, it's owned by one Mrs. Smith. Um, yeah, this is sort of a, a period where um, all of the surrounding parks areas had, had not been totally developed yet. And here's an example of, um, you know, Mrs. Smith owning a couple different parcels around here. Wellington is obviously a big name. Let's jump ahead and see if this uh, changes at all. Uh, the heirs, so it looks like someone died and maybe inherited the land. Um, I wonder, we probably aren't gonna see anything until we get way further. Um, what is this, is there an address to this? Um, let's just see what address these are. So it was 1190? Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, I think that would be over here. Okay. Um, you can actually rotate the map a little bit. Uh, that can be helpful when you're looking at these uh, these addresses. Um, so that's that's where it sent us. That blue dot is the... Oh, uh, so wait, George is now saying to try 1195. Because it was on the odd side of the street. Okay, so that's 1223 right here. Um row contracting company um 1924 it looks like that's the latest map that we have latest coverage of this area um yeah i think this whole 1100 block um looks like it was a quarry yeah i'm not i'm not sure that we're gonna crack um yeah, eleven fifty three is the uh, the only eleven hundred block address that I I think I'm getting uh, on in nineteen twenty four. Um, I can't. I'll take a let's see if uh, yeah, eleven ninety, eleven ninety five. 
Yeah, I'm just not sure. I think this is another one where we would we would really just need to do a little bit more uh, digging right into into how this landscape had changed and how some of the property had, had moved hands. I can't remember from the chat um, uh, what uh, what year you think it might might have been? Uh, well, uh, the initial question as said it was the mid nineteenth century. Yeah, interesting. Interesting. I don't think we have an. I don't think there's anything in there that goes back that far. Yeah, 1874 is the is the earliest that we have. You know, this might be a case where if you want to learn more about, you know, what's going on in the mid nineteenth century, you might reference the trigonometric surveys, which were largely published in the 1850s. Um, those were the, again, Henry F. Walling was the maker of many of those. So let's see. It's a great we question. Have one though. more address. Yeah, yeah let's one go. more address, and then we have other questions. So Carl's asking for 29 Newbury Street in Somerville. I don't know if Somerville's in, if you have Somerville. Uh, yep, we do have Somerville. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to see how old their cousin house, there's cousin's house is. I don't know how, how Newbury's spelled uh it's n-e-w-b-u-r-y u-r-y perfect all right let's head over there all right so we've got a uh two atlas layers that cover this area um uh, <clears throat> and let's see if the address has changed uh i think that yeah it doesn't actually list what address it is right here but i wonder if um finney and bartow it seems are the owners in 1874 we can jump ahead about 20 years. Um, we see quite a bit of development in, in this street. Um, and the oops, uh, the property owner now uh, is... Uh, uh, man, I have... Clara, Clara T. Bain, I think. Clara T. Bain. Um, on 29 Newberry. Yeah, this is a really interesting uh, sort of residential area where you can just see how um how rapidly i think uh the construction of the neighborhood sort of expanded over that the last this 20 year period again we can change this uh so that we've got the base layer from 20 years prior and sort of see that geography uh changing and people moving in and getting all these yellow wooden wooden homes um as well as places that have still yet to be developed, right? In this spot right here, the city of Cambridge owns this stone quarry, uh, or at least what used to be a stone quarry and what has been parceled out uh, for urban development. You know, all of these, again, are real estate maps um, at the end of the day. So that's a that's a great one. Um, really interesting to see how that shakes down. So thanks for that. Okay, so Penelope has a question that I think I can answer. She says, I have looked at physical maps of 19th century Chicago at the Chicago History Museum. I ran into the situation where the historical address I sought was someplace else today. I learned this from the librarian. How will I know if a street has been renamed, et cetera, when looking on my own? So what I can say for Boston is, I don't know how, I can't speak for Chicago, but in Boston, we have other resources that can tell you uh, the street what the streets used to be. So there's one book that we use a lot that was published in 1915 that gives a complete history of street name changes and everything like that. I don't know if Chicago has a similar resource, but I think it'd be worth contacting the Chicago Public Library. So if they're, they're pretty comparable to the BPL. So I would imagine they would probably also have some resources like we do that can help you figure out what the address is now. Yeah, I think that's spot on. The only thing I would add is that Internet Archive is, is a really amazing resource. You can probably find that 1915 uh, book uh, on Internet Archive, which digitizes a lot of materials actually at BPL. Um, so I bet and the way that like I would search for that is a, a historic street index or what's known as a gazetteer. Um, and those gazetteers are just lists of, of street names from a certain time. Okay, so I think, uh, okay, so further on that from Penelope. So should I should look up a historical address from a census, say with a map from the same era, and that will show me what that place is called now via the modern map. So I think she's trying to, she's asking about the layers in the map. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so if you, so um, 
Yeah, if you look if you look up if you find a historical address, well, I, we run into this problem all the time with um with make like using these old atlascope layers and other web mapping applications where you know, you might be trying to to locate these addresses and 50 shamit ends up 500 feet away from where it's supposed to be because the historic address is not the same as the modern address. So I think uh, if if I'm reading this correctly, what you're getting at is is kind of uh, cross referencing using like Google Maps or some other modern map uh, as you look at the historic map or as you search for that historic address to just see what it is today. If you can figure out what the historic address corresponds to today, that's what you would want to search in Atlascope. Um, our address searching system is only plugged in to modern street addresses. Um, Again, that's like a many years down the road thing that we would love to add as a historic gazetteer. Um, but unfortunately, that is, uh, for, for a variety of reasons, is, is kind of a big lift. So it's still in progress. Okay, so I'm sorry. I missed an earlier one, an earlier question. Let me go back. So David was asking, does the BPL have the three volume Myers Gazetteer published in 1912 in Germany? So I'm not quite sure what, let me see, just take a quick look in our catalog. So that's something, uh, it, it might not show up in the online catalog because it is fairly old. So what you can do is send us an email to ask at bpl.org and we can look into that for you and get back to you. But I'm just gonna do a quick search here. So that's not coming up in the online catalog, but that doesn't mean we don't have it. it. Just means it's not in the online catalog. So definitely if you're interested in looking at that, just send us an email and we will look into our other resources that we check into and we will get back to you. Okay, so Meredith is asking, are there any online courses available on using historic maps for genealogy? Uh, I, you know, I am not aware offhand um, of any formal courses for it. Uh, you know, you might be able to like audit a class from an online uh, library science program, maybe that, you know, if you wanted to go through a, like the university route. Um, and it could be worth looking at, um, oh, Jesse, what are those? They, they were, they're popular a few years ago. They're these like online, um, these virtual cl classes that you can sign up for. I'm not, uh, there's master a class. Maybe. Yeah. It's sort of similar to that. I don't think master class is the one, but um I know we have are... so many so we had, it's a LinkedIn learning is what it's called now. It used to be lynda.com. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds that's I think that kind of thing might have some answers for you. But honestly, like there are so many just like free resources that, you know, whether it's stuff like what we're doing right now or um, other existing uh, presentations and videos uh, from local historical associations and libraries, I would really start there and just see what else you can find other guides and resources. Uh, from, so from we have a few suggestions coming in in the chat. So, yeah, so someone is suggesting the Allen County Public Library. Definitely, yeah, check them out. They have a massive genealogy center, and apparently they have a lot of recorded sessions. So that's something. And also, Google can be your friend. If you just do a search for something like that, you might find something. Yeah, these are great. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm very much not a genealogist, so this is all... Uh, helpful for me too. I sort of come from the map perspective. Right. That's why we have you. <laughs> okay. So Penelope is asking, can anything be printed out from Atlas Scope? I uh, let me look. I we've we have tested that as a feature, but I don't think we've actually deployed it. Um yeah, we so you know for the time being what I would recommend is just going to the view that you want. Like, let's say we want to look at this view right here. Um, if you want that little blue dot to go away, you might have to uh, refresh the page and go there manually um, or go to like start at BPL and then actually 
uh, page over to Somerville because that blue dot appears. Um, oh yeah, that it's still there. So it, that might be something that we want to edit or, or tweak a little bit because I think you have to refresh it. Um, that appears after you've searched a place. Uh, anyway, um, let's say we just want to print this out. Uh, I would just recommend uh, screenshotting it. And if you're not sure how to screenshot something, it's um, uh, there are little keystrokes you can do. You can look it up on Google. That's a uh, it'll teach you you know what buttons to press whether you're on a Mac or a or a Windows. But I just use on a Windows Command Shift Four, and then that brings open my screenshot, and I would just grab it like this. Um, that gets me my little Atlascope view as as an as a flat image file, and you can print that out from your sort of you know word processor of preference. Um, you could also maybe print it like this, just like print the browser page, although that is going to get formatted kind of funny. We'd probably have to do it as a landscape. Yeah, that's a bad, eh, eh, not very good, is it? So I would just use the screenshot for now. There's also um, what I, because I have done this, I haven't printed, but I've had to save images. Um, on Windows laptops, there's something called the snip tool, the snipping tool where you can basically take a screenshot, but not the whole screen. Yeah, where you can just take a picture of what you want to look at and then you copy it uh, into paint and then you can save it as a JPEG and then you can print it from there. I have not printed, but I have saved a lot of images from Atlas Scope that way. So that's the snipping tool that's on PCs. I think Mac has a similar thing. I'm just not sure what it's called. Uh, oh, so Meredith is saying on Mac, it's the capture tool. There we go. So yeah. that's actually what I would recommend is that way you're not getting the header from the browser and all that. It does. And I will just add it sort of to, like if you want to print it in, uh, if you want to put it in like a document or something, obviously that's the way to go. But there is this useful feature for sharing. Um, so you can go anywhere on Atlas Scope. You know, let's go to the West End, a place that uh, experienced significant change in, in Boston over the 20th century. If we click share right here, you can copy this link. Um, and if you copy that link and, you know, we can pay, we could close Atlas Scope and paste that link in, that will bring us right back to this view. So you can sort of save and share specific views uh, by the URL that way. Um, and in some cases that might do the uh, sort of get you where you need to go. Okay. So we have one final question. This is from Meredith. She's asking, do you know of any historic mapping of disease spread in the Boston area? Yeah, so we have some really interesting maps of that in Boston, the mid 19th century. Um, if you're asking about disease maps, uh, you might be familiar with the famous John Snow cholera map. Uh, the, he was an epidemiologist. I think 1854 is when this happened, but he mapped the sort of sources of cholera in the in London from this one water pump on Broad Street. Um, and they were able to sort of make a uh, big headway on understanding the germ theory of disease uh, by knowing that that source of water was contaminated. So there is a cholera map of Boston from a few years before, uh, 1849. And I always think that this is so funny. It shows the course of cholera in Boston. Um, down here in Fort Hill, uh, which is not really a modern Boston neighborhood, but was commonly labeled on maps at this time. And funny enough, Broad Street is where it happened. So that the outbreak was on the same, na same named street. Uh, in Boston. Unfortunately, this map, even though it was uh, created five years before the Jon Snow one, this they, they didn't have the same sort of um, breakthrough uh, as the other map allowed. So this is one interesting map that shows the source of disease spread. There are a couple other ones too. So we have this um, in Boston, but the management of public health and disease and illness in the 19th century city was a huge, huge point of um, sort of consideration, right? So there, these were mapped generally by the city itself, um, different departments. What is this, 18, yeah, 1874, a really interesting map that shows um, uh, health districts. Uh, so in the late 19th century, Boston established what they called health districts to evaluate uh, the health and wellness of, of certain areas. Um, and in many cases, you know, those health 
uh, what what constituted a healthy population was wrapped up in all sorts of other social factors like class and race and immigration status um, that that were oftentimes really uh, racist and, vi and violent. Um, but at any rate, uh, these are fascinating uh, sources of, of some of those uh, materials. So hopefully that answers your question. I can send these in, in the chat uh, if you want, but you could also search just on our collections portal um, for you know keywords like cholera. And, and that's how I found these, just searching for, for cholera. I think that's what pops it up. Yeah. All right. So let's see. So actually there's one more question. So Eric is asking, could I video record my screen while doing an Atlas scope zoom without violating any copyright? Yeah, thanks for um thanks for thinking of that. Uh, Atlas scope is totally like free to reproduce and use. Um it's an open copyright. So as long as I mean we appreciate um we appreciate sort of uh being acknowledged. Um in, in tools like Atlas Scope, you know, uh, the urban atlases themselves are are totally in the public domain. Um, so yeah, there's no copyright issue with that. Okay, so yeah, so if you could, there are people interested in that link there. So. Hey, let me just send, um, I'll just send this link with the key, cholera keyword searched. Um, there we go. And I'll say, there are other um, really interesting, My one of my favorites is the map of odors Oh. The map showing some of the stinkiest odors perceived. That is in fascinating. 1978. This was a map on display in our um, exhibition on environmental justice in Boston. And oh. so this really interestingly highlights both um, sort of areas of acute odor, which is where those circles are. I think those are, are su like wells, maybe, um, or sewage, like sewage locations. And then you've got these red hashed areas. Um, like the um these mud flats um the mud, mud sewage flats basically where people would dump uh, and drain sewage uh nancy seashoals uh has this amazing book called gaining ground which details oh, yeah. the of land making in boston um and this area right here the muddy river flats uh is sort of uh she she finds all these letters from her book that talk about how this was uh, insufferably horrible um, and ultimately becomes, as we know it today, the Back Bay Fens. Um, so these capture some really interesting changes in the landscape. I'll send this one in the chat as well. Okay. Then I will send a link because we, uh, BPL has several copies of Gaining Ground if you ever want to see it. And she actually did a lot of research for that book here at the BPL. Oh yes, I was I was working here when that came out and it was very exciting. All right, so I think that's it. So we're, we're just about out of time. So thank you so much, Ian. This has been a wonderful presentation. We really appreciate you coming, you doing this for us while you're at a conference. And it's always a pleasure. This is such a fun, a fun thing yeah. to talk about. So I'm, I'm glad that folks uh, enjoyed it. And again, don't hesitate to reach out at the MAP Center. I'm always uh, happy to chat more. Yes. And thank you to everyone who came, and especially those of you who stuck with us to the end here. We really appreciate it. You've had some really great questions. We really appreciate having you guys here. And I will be sending an, a, an email tomorrow night with links to everything we discussed and the chat transcript and the handouts and everything you could think of. And eventually I will be able to send you a link to the recording. So that's about all. I hope everyone has a wonderful evening. Thanks, everyone.